I don't know if it was fear of regret or just that whole attitude of, you know, you only get one life and you have to just go out and give things a try and you never regret anything that you try. Welcome to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast with Bree Noble. Bree is a musician, entrepreneur, speaker, and founder of Women of Substance Music Radio and Podcast. Bree's interviews with successful female musicians and industry pros are both inspirational and informational. She also answers your questions about the music business. Bree is on a mission to help you create great music, connect with your fans, and grow your business, and to truly become a female entrepreneur musician. Hey, this is Bree Noble. Thanks for tuning in to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Show, where we help you learn to make great music, how to connect with your audience, and how to grow your business. I feel like I need to be practicing my English accent today because I'm talking to Callahan, and she has such a wonderful accent, and I just can't quite do it, so I won't even try. But she is from the UK, and she came to Atlanta in 2010 to make her first album with Sean Mullins, which I am so envious of. So you're going to hear a lot more about her later. But first, I want to highlight a few things. If you go to femusician.com, that's for femaleentrepreneurmusician.com, you can grab our totally free resource, 19 Proven Sources of Income That You Probably Haven't Considered for Your Music Business. You can also get some free training at our training tab, and you can listen to any of the previous episodes that you may have missed of this podcast with our fabulous guests. Speaking of podcasts, I want to tell you about a podcast that I know you're going to love if you haven't listened to it already. It's one of my favorites. It's very similar to this show, but has a little bit different slant. It's called The Brassy Broadcast. It's all about women in the music business, and it's hosted by my friend Jen, who you may remember from episode number six, but she does a great job finding really interesting women in the music business, and they talk all about the ins and outs of what goes on in the music business on every subject that you can think of. Everything from licensing to touring to songwriting to running a music store to running a music school to being in a big movie about music. I mean, everything you can think of. So go check that out at BrassyBroad.com or on iTunes. Look for the Brassy Broadcast. Speaking of iTunes, I want to remind you that you can win merch from the artists that we have on this show by giving us a rating and review on iTunes. If you just go to our show on iTunes, which is really easy to find right now because we are number one on New and Noteworthy under the Music Podcasts, click on our show, you click on ratings and reviews, and then you click on write a review. We draw a winner every week from the people that have given us reviews. And this week, our reviewer that has won the prize is Stephanie Roberts. She says, this is gold. I cannot wait to share this with my female musician entrepreneur friends. Bree's enthusiasm is contagious and her experience and wisdom is a tremendous resource. Can't wait to hear more. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Please contact me at brie at femusician.com to claim your prize and I'll be sure to get it to you. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our guest, Callahan. Nashville-based singer-songwriter Callahan is releasing her new album, A History of Now, on April 7th, 2015. Featuring her trademark style, which blurs the lines between pop, adult contemporary, and Americana. After recording her first album, Life in Full Color, with Sean Mullins in 2010, she spent four years touring and building her fan base, starting with shows with only 20 people attending to now being a headliner. On her epic tours, she logged more than 50,000 miles per year and was able to open in shows for Sean Mullins, Ed Kowalczyk, and more. So that's a little bit about Callahan. I would love to know, is there anything that you want to tell us that's a little bit more personal that's not in your bio? Uh, Well, I'm from from the UK and I've um, I've been over here for about five years now. It's coming up to five years. I moved here in 2010 and um, yeah, I've just been having a great time really getting to know the uh, American audience and uh, getting to tour over here. Um, I've been to 46 states so far, so I'm definitely getting to see a lot of the country. And um, Wow. So which ones have you not been to? Um, Alaska, Hawaii, North Dakota, and Nebraska. 
Okay. Uh, that could be an interesting tour. Just uh, Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you could combine those on a tour. That would be hard. <laughs> well, I was thinking, you know, because I do this uh, house concert tour every year and it's getting bigger and bigger. And I was thinking, um, wow, next year, how can we um, how can we top it? You know, and I'm thinking maybe it should just be called the um, the Alaska and Hawaii tour next year and just <laughs> just do both of those and spend a few weeks in Hawaii. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Mm. I would definitely love that. OK, so I would love to know, how did you get started in music? Well, um, I can't really, I can't really remember, you know, I mean, it was so, it feels like just one of those things that's always been in my life, you know, I mean, my parents are big music fans, I have two older sisters, and we were all encouraged really young to take up instruments and, you know, exposed to a lot of different music, and there was always music playing in the house, in the car, just everywhere I went, really, um, and so it's always just been a focal point of my life. Um, I particularly got into singing when I was really little, um, and always knew that that was what I, you know, really wanted to do. I got such a buzz from singing and, um, and then when I was about five or six, I took up the flute, um, after seeing, uh, James Galway in concert. And I just thought he was just absolutely mesmerizing. And, um, so I, I convinced my mom, you know, I said, I want to go take flute lessons. And she said, well, I'm not buying you one until you've proved that you really want to do that. So um, so she found this old bamboo flute, like in the back of a cupboard somewhere and said, right, if you if you learn on that and you, you know, stick with it, then I'll buy you one. So um, I did that for about, I guess, an eight or nine years and um, did all the classical training and everything. And then the, uh, you know, the singing really was taking over and I wanted to be able to perform and, and I started songwriting um, when I was 15. So, um, so yeah, the whole classical thing kind of took a back seat and uh, I went down the singer songwriter route from there. Mm. Did you ever do classical singing or just classical flute? Mm, no, I never did classical singing. Um, it was always, you know, because I wanted to do songwriting, it was always, um, you know, the, the style of music, whatever I was listening to, I then went through phases of writing. Um, but it never, I mean, although I love classical singing, you know, I'm a huge Andrea Bocelli fan. And, you know, I love listening to that and voices that are so pure and, um, you know, very technically, you know, amazing. Um, it's not something that I've, I've kind of, uh, gone down that route, but, um, yeah, I certainly, I certainly like listening to it. Well, you've definitely got your niche with your songwriting because it's amazing. Oh. I, have, I love your songs. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, are you, do you consider yourself right now a full-time musician? And if so, how long have you been full-time, like basically not getting income from anything but music? Yeah, I'm, I would consider myself full-time plus a bit. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh. <laughs> it's like... You're working overtime. Oh my God. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah definitely definitely full time it's um i guess since since i left the uk it's um it's been like that i mean i was doing music before moving to america but it was in addition to other things as well um then when i recorded my first album here in 2010 with Sean Mullins um that's when i really took the leap of kind of moving into i'm going to give this a go completely you know focus all my energies on it and um see what happens and um yeah it's been pretty non-stop since then so yeah I mean I'm, I know I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do music full-time and earn a living from it and um you know see that it, everything keeps growing every year as well so that's uh really rewarding you took a big risk moving from England to come here what what prompted that and was was there maybe a something in the back of your mind that said, you know, you're going to have regrets if you don't just like take a huge risk and go for it. Um, I don't know if it was fear of regret or just that whole attitude of, you know, you only get one life and you have to just go out and give things a try and you never regret anything that you try. So, um, you know, this, this opportunity came up to work with Sean Mullins and he's such a musical hero of mine. And, you know, I'd listened to him for so long and he'd, his album Soul's Core really was, you know, one of the earliest albums that got me into songwriting. And um, so when the chance to work with him came up, it was kind of a no brainer of thinking, 
this is this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and I would be crazy if I didn't take this. So, um, yeah, that really opened the door over here. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been great. I've just, you know, I always have that attitude that if something doesn't work out, well, then you move on to something else, you know, and onto the next idea. And yeah, if nothing else, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go over to the U S for a year and tour with him and make my album and, if nothing else came from it, it would be an amazing story. But, um, you know, luckily I've worked really hard at it and, um, you know, continue to grow everything to the point now where I'm doing my own headline shows. So it's, um, yeah, it's definitely paying off. And how did you get that opportunity with Sean Mullins and what was it like working with him? Oh, it was fantastic working with him. You know, um, a lot of people had said to me, oh, it's just difficult meeting your, you know, I don't want to use the word idol, but, you know, people that you look up to that much, it's difficult meeting them because sometimes they can be a huge disappointment. And uh, Sean was not at all. He was the total opposite of that. He was as lovely as I could have ever hoped for, you know, um, a really genuine guy. And, you know, I think it was amazing to me that he put that amount of work and effort into helping launch my career over here. Um and he totally didn't have to, you know, it was just because he was passionate about what I was doing. Um, and I guess wanted to pay it forward as well from people that had helped him at the beginning of his career. And he wanted to give a bit of that back. And, you know, I will always be grateful to him for, for taking that chance on me and you know, giving me such giving me such a, a good start over here. Um, it all came about when I emailed him on MySpace which was back in 2009. And this is totally, um, you know, another example, I guess, of me just trying stuff and seeing what happens. Um, I had wanted to get in touch with him for a while. Um, and the only way I could figure to, you know, send him a message was through MySpace. And so I did that and sent him a couple of songs. And um, he amazingly saw the message and listened to the songs and loved what I did and invited me over to Atlanta. So one of those, you never know kind of moments. <laughs> that is so amazing because you'd think he would get, you know, tons of people doing that and he'd just have to like pass it off to somebody or just say, I can't possibly look at all these messages. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And that's how I thought, but you know, um, I'm definitely quite an impulsive person and think, you know, I'm going to try it anyway. And, and who knows what might happen. And, you know, luckily it was his sound guy, uh, Kip Connor, who was working with him at the time, had seen this message and heard about me through some other, I don't know whether he'd seen me on the internet somewhere else or something like that, and had kind of drawn Sean's attention to it and said, you need to listen to this. So, you know, when I was on tour with Sean, I always made a point as well thanking Kip because, <laughs> you know, it was uh, it was him that kind of drew Sean's attention to the message. And um you know, and then Sean took the time to listen to it and um, got in touch. So, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a, a bit of luck involved. <laughs> wow. Well, I guess you never know. You may as well, you know, try. Um, I would love to hear about we have a lot of struggling artists that are just getting started or, you know, are trying to build their career. And you've had so much success, but I'd love to hear about a time that maybe you had difficulty and you felt like maybe you might want to give up or you just didn't know where to go next in your career and how you moved forward from that and what you learned. Yeah. I mean, I think it's true from any, you know, any business that you're starting out on your own. Um, you, you have those moments where it's difficult and you feel like you're hitting a brick wall and, you know, you're kind of thinking, I just need one person to, you know, help. Um, and then, and then you get, you become more positive and, you know, I always just think of it that you never know what's coming, you know, next week or the week after or who you're going to meet um, tomorrow. And you've just got to keep on plugging away at it and you've got to keep on making connections with people and being open to opportunities when they arise and really taking everything, you know, everything that you possibly can and getting involved. And, um, yeah, you just never know whether it might be someone that you met at a gig one night and you talk to. Um, six months down the line you might say hey do you want to come do this radio show or do you want to come play in this new venue or you know there's all kinds of stuff that might um, come out of it so I think the networking side of it I think is absolutely crucial and um, you know just to keep on feeling that determination of just never ever giving in because I think you know for me that's 
it seems like for independent artists, that's what separates the people that are successful and are not, is that um, some people give up and some people don't. And, um, you know, I've certainly never got to a point where I've thought, oh, maybe I'll do something different. Because um, I think if you're having those thoughts, then maybe you should do something different. Because you have to you have to be able to put 100%, you know, of your energy behind it all the time. Otherwise, um, you know, it's too, it's too difficult. So. Right. Well, is there anything that you like, maybe that, you know, now that you wish you would have known then, and how do you think that would have changed your, the course of your career? Uh, I think, I think the, um, you know, the determination part of it, um, maybe if someone had told me earlier on you know that um things don't have to be happening every day you know there's, there's no such thing as an overnight success so don't worry about that you know that there's no time period that you have to stress yourself out about of um well if it hasn't happened by next month then you know it's never going to happen um i think um you know all of those stories that you that you hear about the overnight successes are never what they seem anyway and um you know I think if someone had just maybe explained to me earlier on that um it's going to take time and you just have to keep on you know plugging away at it and keep on doing what you're doing and believing in it then that might have taken some of the some of the stress out of um you know a lot of people think you know, younger artists I think feel that it has to happen overnight and then there are a lot of things in the media that kind of um you know, keep that perception going as well. Um, so I think for singer songwriters and um, that, you know, those kind of artists, you have to have that time to be able to grow as a performer and a writer and find your own fan base and grow it um, so that, you know, you, you have a career that actually lasts and, um, you know, is sustainable. That's so true. I had an artist on last week and um, she, or a couple weeks ago, and she said, you know, I just want people to know that just because you're over 30, like you're not dead, like your career's not dead. You have a lot more time. You have a lot more talent to give the world. And people think that you have to do it when you're young or you're just out of, out of it, you know, you're done. Right. And there was so much response to that. People were like, yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Because I mean, when you think about it, especially for the genre of singer songwriter, people want you to have opinions on things. They want, you know, to have lived a bit and to have, um, you know, an opinion of something that you're writing about and you're sharing with someone and you don't necessarily have that when you're 21. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of time, I think, to grow as an artist and, you know, experience the world and, um, have things, interesting things to write about and, um, interesting perspectives on life. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you think, you know, you look at all of the, um, performers that are still around now, um, that have been doing it for years and years and, and no one thinks that they're getting any less, um, you know, special just because they happen to now be in their sixties. So, um, yeah, I think that, I think that's definitely true. Yeah, definitely a good point. What do you think makes you unique as an artist and how have you capitalized on that? Well, I don't, I don't know that uh, anything makes anyone more unique than the next person. I mean, I think, um, you know, that, that's the wonderful thing about how, how different everyone is, how different every artist is that you all have, you know, everyone comes from things that from a different angle, you know, I've had a different upbringing to someone else who's writing about the same, you know, subject matter. Um, and so it all depends what kind of spin you can give on, on to, you know, uh, a subject or a song. Um, I mean, you know, some people have said that my voice is quite unique, that, um, that, that, that certainly draws some people in. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just, that's the main thing for me is just, um, you know, just, uh, having that different perspective on on life really and uh and and that's what makes writing you know and music so interesting well i think you're definitely known for having close relationships with your fans i've heard that from a lot of people and i just would love to know how you develop those relationships and how you maintain them and you know what what tools have maybe helped you keep in touch with your fans well i always try and take time after a show to go and speak to the people that have come out to the show you know I sign CDs and chat to them and um 
really until you know until everyone's gone I always try and make make sure that everyone's had some time to say hello and um you know I've thanked them for coming and I, and I never take it for granted that people are going to come out to the shows um you know I want to really take care of my fans and um in return you know they do things like um you know pledge support on my on my previous well this newest album um I did through pledge music and we reached 170% of the goal that we'd set and uh, had about 350 people involved and so you know on the other side of it they then step up and um help with things like that so it's um it's a real two-way street you know of um a real reciprocal relationship with them wow that's amazing 170% yeah i i really you know focus with this on people that i am coaching is you got to build your fan base up because then when you do want to come out with a new album, you've got something to draw on. You can't just expect that people that don't know you are going to, you know, give you money in a pledge campaign. Right. Yeah. And I think these days as well with things like Twitter and Facebook and, you know, your website and Instagram and that there's so many places where people can directly connect with the musician and, you know, the artist can connect with the fans and, and they kind of, you know, a lot of people expect that now. And, um, you know, if you if you shut yourself at, off from that, then you're really missing out, I think, because, um, you know, there is there is a real potential to to go out there as an independent artist and find your fan base and have them, um, you know, kind of evangelize about your music to everyone and and help build it. And you don't necessarily then have to rely on a label um, you know, waving a magic wand. Um, you can get out there and, and find your own audience and um, connect with them directly. And that's something I think that musicians in this day and age have, um, you know, which is phenomenal compared to how things were maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Wow. I think I need to make you my spokesperson. That's exactly what I tell people. You do not <laughs> necessarily need a label nowadays. You can right. do so much on your own and then you can keep all the money for yourself, you know? Right. And also it's, um, you know, the longer that I've been doing it, um, the more, you know, I mean, it, it, the more you have to learn as you go along and, and you discover that, okay, the the songwriting and the performing is one side of it, but there's, that's, you know, maybe a few hours a day and um, the rest of it, there's a lot that goes into, you know, making sure that you, that you answer people's emails and, um, you know, reply to their messages and comments on Facebook and, you know, collect their email addresses at shows and, follow up with that and keep people you know up to date with what you're doing and really kind of create you know put some time into that relationship and um yeah definitely pays off this is great stuff so what is the maybe the most mind-blowing experience that you've had where you felt like oh my gosh pinch me i can't believe i'm here doing this <laughs> well there was um i got an article in billboard magazine um last year for my house show tour, which was absolutely amazing. It was like a four page spread in Billboard magazine, which was, um, you know, a real kind of moment of thinking, wow, I must be doing something right. Cause you know, Billboard is such a legendary magazine to have recognized my tour. Um, and off the back of that, then, um, there was someone up in the, in the Northwest, who was starting a, a concert series at a casino up there and um, a singer-songwriter series. And he'd read the article in the Billboard um, you know, magazine and had booked me to go play there. And I got to take my whole band up there and you know, the radio station got behind it and um, played a song from my album a lot. And we ended up with 1,200 people in the room and... Um, a really amazing venue and you know I had my whole band with me and it was just a fantastic show and that was definitely a moment where I thought all right this feels pretty amazing that um you know there's 1200 people that have come out to see us and um yeah and there was billboards huge big billboards all over Portland um you know with the with the album artwork on and uh yeah that felt really exciting that is so cool. I have to say that the article said that you reshape, sorry, there's a ton of thunder going on here. I think my house is going to fall down. <laughs> the, the, the article said that you reshape the landscape of touring. I mean, I like it was, they was really complimentary of you. 
What do you think that our artists that are listening can learn from the way that you do your tours? Um, I think just the, I think, you know, the billboard were really focusing in on how, how much I've got into the house show touring. And um, I do that in addition to my regular touring. And it's kind of become a bit of a template now for, for building, you know, your audience because this country is so enormous and it takes so long to build um, an audience in one um, market. So I kind of get around that by going to do a house show or a couple of house shows in an area, um, grow enough fans in that market and then go back and do a public show and then all those people will come out and tell their friends about it and it kind of grows from there. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of how I've been doing it and with the house show touring, you know, with the Callahan Across America tour, which happens once a year I I travel from coast to coast just doing house concerts and so that's just a great way of of you know expanding my fan base all across the country uh, with very little overhead because I really just have to drive to the house and then you know we travel with our own PA gear um, and uh, we usually stay with the people so there's no hotel or food bill or anything like that and um and at the end of the night, you've got maybe, you know, they kind of range from 30 to some of them have been over 100 um, people at the show. Uh, and you end up with a whole room full of super fans who want to shout about it to all their friends. So, um, yeah, it's been a really fantastic way of, of growing their touring. Wow, that's a great grassroots approach, because as you said, the first time you go to the town, you've got house concerts. Maybe the next time or the second or third album, by the time you get there, you know, it's grown, it's gone a little bit viral, and then now you can play bigger venues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Love that approach. So um, tell us about your new album. It just came out. It's called The History of Now, right? A History of Now, yeah. A History of Now. And what was the process like making that album? Well, that was, um, it was really a lot of fun, you know, because I'd, um, I had a lot of songs that I'd wanted to put on, you know, that I'd written over the couple of years since releasing my first album. And um, I'd really taken some time between the two records to, you know, write more. I was touring a lot, um, just having some experiences and living life. And um, so I felt when, you know, I'd really got some solid material to want to put into the second record. And... Uh, I got to work with Dennis McCoskey on this, who is a writer and producer in Nashville. And uh, the two of us met through a mutual friend in Nashville and started writing together and just really hit it off from the moment, you know, that from the first song that we wrote, I thought, oh, this is going to be something special because we really, really think along the same lines. And he definitely hears things the same way that I do. Like when we were in the studio, I would be listening back to a bass part or something like that. And I'd be thinking, uh, something's not quite right, you know, and I'd turn to Dennis to tell him and he would literally, the same words would come out of his mouth. So mm. um, it was a really fun, you know, collaboration to work with him. And uh, we ended up writing about five songs together for the album. And uh, yeah, I really, really, really love this record. Wow. I really like it too. And I'm curious, why, why did you decide to put Best Year on this album as well? I know you re did a remix of it. Um, is it a very popular song of yours? Yeah, it is. And, you know, that, that song really has, is probably one of the, you know, most special to me because it's really become an anthem for me over the last four or five years of living here. Um, and it really, to me, it just seemed to capture that feeling of, you know, I wrote it just a couple of months after leaving the UK. and you know, it's still, it still kind of resonates with me and with a lot of people that, I, you know, I play it to at shows that just that feeling of, of not being scared to try things, just, just giving it a go, getting out there and, and experiencing life and, and seeing what happens. And, um, you know, every single year has kind of topped the last one so far. And, uh, <laughs> so I thought, well, I want to just, you know, I'm, I'm not kind of ready to give up on this song yet. And, uh, you know, Dennis really wanted to re-record it and we got, um, you know, it's, it's quite different from the first album. And so it's kind of been given a new, a new take. And, um, 
yeah, it still just means a lot to me, that song. So, and I get a lot of people coming up to me at the end of shows and saying that's kind of become their theme song as well. So, um, yeah, I feel like it, it spreads some positivity. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love having one of those inspirational kind of songs in your set because people really identify with that. People are kind of craving that positivity, I think. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, when they come out to hear live music, people want to have some escape, um, I think. And um, they want to be uplifted and feel positive about life. And, you know, there's a lot of songs on the new album that that kind of touch on that of the, you know, like Crazy Beautiful Life um is the is the single over here and you know that's really about the the craziness and unpredictability of life and equally how amazing it can be you know and um that you've just got to kind of take it all as it comes and and soak it all in and think you know um uh, life is for for living i would love to hear about your um income streams we have artists listening that are trying to build their career and i know that a lot of musicians have a lot of different income streams that kind of make up this combination that is their, you know, living. Can you give us an idea of where you get most of your income from? I'm sure a lot of it's from shows, but you know, you're a songwriter, so you probably bring in stuff from licensing. And yeah, if you could just give us a little kind of a picture of that. Yeah, mo most of it does come from live shows. That's definitely the biggest uh, income stream um also selling cds most of them are from live shows you know i still feel like even though a lot of people download music these days they still so many people still want to have the physical cd in their hand at the end of a show that they can come get signed and uh you know kind of have as a bit of a memento of the show i think so um yeah that's definitely a huge huge part of it shows and merchandise at shows and uh yeah the licensing thing i've not i've not got too far into yet but that's definitely something i'm focusing on with a new record um so uh yeah definitely um that would be amazing so <laughs> oh do you have a book recommendation um or maybe an online resource that you like for information either about um how to build your business how to write music or just how you know something that helps you with personal development um, I mean, I do, I read things online now and again, and, um, you know, I've read some industry books and that kind of thing. The thing I find frustrating quite often is that, um, it's all a bit too abstract and, um, you know, people can have ideas, but, but don't really give you practical advice about how to, you know, put them into, into practice. And, um, you know, one I read recently had said that you should really focus on a very small, um fan base and not worry about trying to get your music out to the whole world but just really narrow it down and you know find out what your market is and really you know zone in on that audience and that that was kind of an example of uh, how someone can give out advice but not really go any further and you think um you know as the artist you're kind of hearing that thinking well that's that's great in theory but really in practice how do I do this? Um, and so I found, you know, that a lot of the times just getting out there and um, getting stuck in has been the best kind of um, learning experience that I could get. And, um, you know, I speak to other people like other artists that have been in the business longer, like Sean Mullins and ask for his advice on, um, you know, certain specifics of the industry or, um, you know, I would read technical books about, publishing and things like that where you really just feel like it's a whole other language that's spoken you know and you have to try and wade your way through all of that um but in terms of building fans i think you just have to get out there and really trust your instinct on who you think your fans are and um and go and connect with them directly and um you know i think you could probably read all the books in the world but it wouldn't it's not going to actually move the needle any further unless you get out there and start working, you know? So, um, yeah, that's kind of been my approach. Well, I like what you said about mentors. Cause to me, that's important. People that are farther ahead than you are in their career. Yeah. You know, you don't have to make all the mistakes. You can just kind of ask them for advice and they can tell you, Oh, I did this. It didn't work. I did this. It works awesome. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, every single artist is different. So something that worked for someone else is not necessarily going to work for you. But, um, you know, I always think you've got to trust 
yourself and your um your own instinct on your own music and your own career and you know take advice but don't just follow it blindly you know really um kind of have a have a say of what you want your career to do because um no one is going to no one is going to push it as much or be as invested in it as the artists themselves you know so you really have to take um ownership of that i think Really great advice. So I can't believe we're already almost over with this interview. It goes so quickly every time. But um, I would love for you to tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you, where they can find you on social media and your website, how they can get your new album. Yeah. So my uh, my website is callahansongs.com. And, uh, can you spell that? Well, yeah. it'll be in the show notes, but you know, people yeah. are listening while they're driving or something. Yeah. It's C A L L A. A G H A N songs.com. Yeah, Callahan has a G in the middle, so it's uh, that's what <laughs> tricks people. But um, is that an English thing? I the uh, G. It's an Irish name. So oh, okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that's my main website. That's where the album uh, you can get all of the albums on there. Um, and then on Facebook, I'm at Callahan Music on Facebook, and that's the same for Twitter as well. So. I'm on, I'm on both of those. Are you on Instagram also? Yes. Callahan music on Instagram as well. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I'm going to go find you cause oh, I'm good. Brie Noble music on, on Instagram. So I'm just get, kind of getting started with Instagram. Oh yeah. It's addictive. All of these things. It, are so they are, they are. You yeah. have to remind yourself I'm working, I'm working. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly four hours have gone by. Right. <laughs> well, thanks so much for talking with me. And um, I'm glad we finally got this interview done. We've been trying to get together for probably six weeks, but you know, you've got such a crazy touring schedule. And I'm glad we found a time when you were going to be in Atlanta that we could talk. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for having me. And there's, um, I forgot to say as well, there's, um, there's a free EP that people can download from my website if they want to get a, a little taster of the music. So there's um, five or six tracks on there. And which track are those from your first album or are they previous to it's that? From, it's from the first album and my live album. So it gives. Oh my gosh. You guys got to go get that. Her first album is amazing also. So I, I think we played on women of substance radio. We probably played like six or seven songs from oh. your first album and probably six or seven songs from the new one. Cause they're just also good. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate you supporting it. It's really, really means a lot. You are welcome. Well, thanks a lot and um, go have some more great shows and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you. Now go out and make great music, connect with your fans and grow your business. Female Entrepreneur Musician has been brought to you by femusician.com and femalemusicianacademy.com with editing by Bree Noble and music by Stella Ronson.